Hey, 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 it's episode 247. Uh, I should have just done Batman, right? So just uh, Batman, just start All going right. with we'll, we'll, we'll start with Batman. All right. It's episode 247. We're recording this episode live. No, I'm not going to do that. Anyway, it's June 9th, 2022. This is Human Factors Cast. I'm a little sick. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Mr. Barry Kirby. That's the whole Batman joke. I was I'm sick, so I'm trying to read it as so. Uh, we do have a great show for you tonight. We're going to be talking about the Transportation Research Board's new construction safety and phasing plans tool, which is a lot cooler than you might actually think. And later, we're going to talk about some questions uh, from the community about UX research being recession proof. Maybe. How much internships add to your ability to qualify for full time roles. And we'll discuss the questions you should be asking project managers before starting research projects. But first, we're back, baby. Yeah. Hey, normally we like to jump straight into the news because we know that's why you're here. But we have a lot of really important updates for June. We hope you'll listen to these and don't skip forward. I said don't skip forward. It's important. So, uh, hey, June is Pride Month um, uh, for anyone who's unaware. <laughs> Pride Month is uh, and we're celebrating queerness over here at uh, Human Factors Cast. And uh, we're kind of launching a pride campaign, if you will. Um, so throughout the month, we're going to be celebrating the LGBTQIA plus community uh, by producing content focused around the intersection of these marginalized communities and human factors, HCI uh, and UX. So, you know, things uh, we're going to be doing are the deep dives. That is something that we do as uh, for, for our patrons, but these will be free to everybody. We want these resources to be widely available. We think it's incredibly important to have these types of resources available. Um, we're going to be putting out some deep dives, maybe. Uh, we'll have some written content, again, focusing on this intersection between human factors and these marginalized communities. We'll also kind of be helping out with general awareness of maybe some of the issues that uh, that are being experienced um, when it comes to human factors, HCI, uh, again, from the perspective of these communities. And last but not least, we're doing a fundraiser. So, um, you know, we are just flat out donating 30% of our June Patreon proceeds to the Trevor Project. Um, if you're unfamiliar, the Trevor Project is it's an American nonprofit uh, kind of founded in 1998. It really focuses on um, suicide prevention efforts among this community, these communities. Um, and and really, uh, they they provide these sort of resources uh, and, and um, sort of a confidential lifeline for people to talk to. So uh, we, we think it's incredibly important. Um, you know, uh, we had our members of our lab select this charity. Um, and, uh, you know, we're beyond that, uh, you know, we, we have changed our logo. I don't know if you've seen our lo new logo. I love it. It's all, it's all colorful. And with that new logo, we have merch. Um, and, uh, you know, contrary to, uh, what's, what's, I guess, corporate standard is, uh, we're, we're not going to take that profit. We're taking 100% of the profits and, or proceeds, I should say, and we're donating that to the Trevor project as well. So, um, you know, go, go to our merch store, buy our pride merch. Uh, it's all going forward to, um, Trevor project. And again, if you join up with us on Patreon this month, 30% of that will be, uh, kicked back to Trevor project. Um, I do want to say, first up this week, we do have uh, our Human Factors Minute that dropped on Tuesday. You probably see it in your feed. It's on sort of uh, the lack of resources um, on the intersection of the of these two things, right? The LGBTQIAP plus community and Human Factors. There's a lack of resources out there for us. So go listen to what we found and what we did not find. Uh, so it was actually guest read by one of our lab members, Rashad. So thank you for doing that. And, uh, you know, it's in your feeds here. You'll get the Human Factors Minutes here as well as on the Human Factors Minute feed as well if you're subscribed to that. Um, but that's all I have for Pride stuff. Barry, uh, you've, you've been busy over at 1202 too. What's going on over there? We've actually produced content. You know, after not producing so stum for for quite a few weeks, I actually pulled my finger out. No, we've had some two really, really good episodes drop. Um, firstly, the the most recent one is with Chris Reed, and those of you uh, who are familiar with HFES will know that he's the current president of HFES. He's also um, a Boeing Technical Fellow within the Environment and Health and Safety Organization at Boeing. And in the interview, he sort of give me a real um, insight into basically how he got into ergonomics and his um, backstory is of, of how he got in there just had me metaphorically drooling uh, the the job opportunities or the the uh, the things that inspired him 
um, was just fantastic to hear. And he, if there's something he saw, he, he seemed to have managed to have picked up all the jobs that I wanted to do, and he did them really early in his career, which was just fantastic. Yeah. What was also really cool from my own perspective, I took the opportunity to um, pick his brain about because obviously he's been president, um, and he's you know, his term ends in I think it's October time. Um, and and so I took the opportunity to sort of pick his brain about when I become president of CHF next year, what could I do? Um, what could I learn from him about um, about how I could do my bit better? So that that was great. But the other bit, which was fab, because obviously we've um, we've been away for a couple of weeks. Um, the first week that we were away on this um, platform, we had the coverage of EHF 2022, and on on my uh, on twelve oh two, we also had a um, me interviewing uh, some of the attendees as well. And so that whole um, coordination between us, uh, between the two channels, showing different content or. Uh, um, from both sides about what it was like to organize and what, what, how people found it, what was the good content, what were the takeaways. Um, I, drew, I think just was an entirely f fantastic week um, of content. So I encourage um, everybody to go back and listen to both of them episodes and and see both them in, in tandem. So yeah, it's been quite a busy week and we've got a few cool interviews coming up as well. So I've actually got a, a full schedule of recording lined up. So looking forward to uh, the next few weeks. It's amazing what happens when you don't have me saying, hey, every Thursday you need to be here. Uh, but <laughs> one thing I'll add to that EHF coverage, you know, Barry was kind enough to donate <laughs> to to our Patreon the full interviews with everybody that he talked to on his end. Uh, he kind of snipped them up for his own episode, and then we we did like a mic micro uh, highlight reel of them on on this episode over here. Uh, and and those full interviews uh, in their entirety are posted up on our Patreon for our for our Patreon members. All right, uh, that's a lot of updates. Thank you for sticking with us. We're gonna get to the news. Like I said, we normally like to do this up top, but here it is. Yeah, Human Factors News. This is the part of the show where we talk about the latest and greatest coming out of the field. Barry, what is the news story this week? So the story this week is looking at Construction Safety and Phasing Plans, ARCP, Web Resource 11. So the Transport Research Board in the U.S. has recently published a web tool to assist with the construction, safety, and zoning plans for airports. The Airport Cooperative Research Program, or ACRP, uh, Web Resource 11, provides airport personnel consulting engineers, designers, and contractors uh, with a detailed process to improve the development and implementation and management of construction safety and phasing plans, or CSPPs, and safety plan compliance documents, CP CDs, it's easy for, for me to say, uh, for airport construction projects. When you go onto this tool, the, the CSPP process is broken into four main phases, which is shown pictor pictorially on the page. The success of each of these four phases is built upon a foundation centered on a culture of safety and collaboration. Each phase contains a process diagram related to that phase of the C uh, CSPP process, a description of each task step within the phase, a list of best practices and lessons learned applicable to the phase, and any tools, templates, or training materials that have been created to aid in the execution of that phase. So when you go on it, you get started by clicking on any of the four phases, the Safety and Collaboration Foundation, um, or, or, the, sorry, or the Safety and Collaboration Foundation to learn more about the aspect of the CSPP process. You can click on the process tab at the top of the page. You'll be taken to a page describing each phase of the CSPP process. And the page also includes a short video describing how the whole thing works. The contents of the web resource was developed based on research completed as part of the ASAP project 0803, which was titled Construction, Safety and Phasing Plans. The research effort included close coordination with the Federal Aviation, uh, Aviation Administration, or the FEA, uh, airports, consulting engineers, designers and contractors to de develop those research findings. The contents of the web resource are not intended to contradict or supersede any regulatory guidance regarding CSPPs, um, SPCDs, or construction safety issued, um, constru construction safety issued by the FAA. The web resource is meant to be is meant to complement the FAA's re existing regu regulatory guidance, as of at this case November 2020, and it's meant to aid airports in the development, implementation, and management of these um, CSPPs and SPCDs effectively under the existing regulatory guidance. 
The point here is the FAA updates their official guidance and materials from time to time. As a result, the users of this web resource are also then encouraged to check the FAA website to identify where the FAA guidance materials may have changed. So that was a long discussion there, Nick, around this new resource. But fundamentally, do you think this is a, a, a good thing, an exciting thing? Wow, that was almost as dry as my throat. So uh, let's <laughs> let's talk about this. So just in broad terms, this is a this is a cool tool that allows for these processes uh, to, to communicate best practices, lessons learned for these processes by which government standards for airports and uh, FAA standards, all that stuff. Um, basically, you're playing ball with all that. So it, long story short, uh, there's a lot of government regulation that needs to happen, especially when it comes to airports. And somebody, th this, uh, this Transportation Research Board has built a tool that will help with communicating some of the best practices um, for folks doing these things. Now, this is in itself a little dry. Yeah, I picked this over a month ago. I said, yeah, we could talk about this pile. But um, I forgot about it, was reminded earlier this week when I put out the, you know, the uh, the, the the poll for, for our listeners to pick. Um, and I, I thought, wow, yeah, no, this is awesome. Like, I think the thing for me about this that... Um, was so intriguing is just the way that they sort of document the information and provide it in sort of the step-by-step -step process that allows for a collaborative experience. Um, you know, it's, it's lessons learned, like, uh, like the, the blurb here says from a variety of different people, consulting engineers, designers, contractors, um, airport personnel, all of them, uh, come coming together to, sort of bring these lessons learned and make sure that no one suffers from those mistakes of the past as you know these uh these construction updates are happening um so that's my initial thoughts barry what about you what's going on with you when well, you saw this if we were all being honest about this when I, i've got to admit when i first read the story as we sort of said even just trying to read through it all and i've, I've actually been through the story and rejigged some of it to try and make it sound a bit more interesting it took me a long time to get into it i was very much of like I don't get this. I don't. I don't see really. I, I couldn't get past the words, but they've got a really cool video on the site, and so I'd encourage anybody who follows the link to go and read the article. Actually, watch the video of it because that's where they they take you through what it does, and then you go and have a play with the tool itself. And really, when you get into it, the real story it's around collaboration. It's around sharing of common data sets, common tools, and the common way of working. So you've got all these different stakeholders. Um, you've got contractors. You've got designers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And one of the most common things that we have problems with when you're working on large projects is people working to what they perceive might be the common process, but actually they're, they're all doing their own processes and somebody's just hoping that they're all coordinating them together. With this, at least you can see you've got a common resource where everybody comes together and you say, right, we're all working off the same page. With this, we're all using the, this, the same process, the same standards, et cetera, et cetera. So that I think is really cool. I do have a bit of a problem, which is why I included it in the blurb, with almost this get out of jail free call clause at the end where it says, you know, must check the with the FAA in, ca in case of changes and things like mm -hmm. that. If you're going to produce a tool like this, part of the responsibility, in my mind, part of the responsibility of you doing that is you have to make sure it's up to date. Um, I don't want, if I was using this, I wouldn't want to sit there and then go and um, go back and then check, do all the work and then go, oh, I better go and check all the, all the sources to make sure they're all relevant. That should be part of the service, as it were. I, I get, you know, it's hard to do that with research, but it's kind of just a right. small flag. But what I really do like is the way that the it steps you through the activities in a graphical way. I'm I'm a I'm a pictures guy. Um, when you can go and drill into right, I want this. I want to be this part of the process. You click on it, it gives you the appropriate bit. That's cool. Um, so yeah, dry, it, it felt like a dry topic when we started, but when you get stuck into it and using it, I think there's um. There's not only it's you must be useful for the people who are using it. It's not my area of uh, area of expertise, um, but you can. Say, I, I like the way that they've done it. I like the way that they've developed that tool. Yeah, I think I think the first thing I'd like to do is kind of almost an audio only <laughs> demo, so to speak, of of what this is. So um, you said this tool is very visual, and that's true. We're going to talk through this as if. Um, well, is is this is a podcast? So if you're listening to this later, <laughs> you're welcome. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's visual, but really it's just uh this this um this safety uh construction safety and phasing 
planning process really is is kind of broken down into four steps, four phases, if you will. Right. There's the pre CSPP, which is a uh, what is that? Construction safety and planning phase, activities phase. So pre CSPP activities phase. Then there's the initial CSPP development phase. And then there's sort of a CSPP implementation and then CSPP management. So you have um, the the pre stuff, the development, the implementation, and the management afterwards. And across all of it is you have this sort of safety and collaboration um, umbrella, if you will. Right. So those are the four phases. Now, if you were to click on any one of those on this web tool, right, you would be brought be brought to a, a sort of um, a, a, a sub page of the tool that gives you a graphical representation of what happens in that phase, right? So if you go to the pre-activities, then you would get, you know, a detailed diagram of what's actually going on in that step, right? What tasks you're having, what checkpoints you have, sort of uh, any major milestones along the way. And that's at the top. So it kind of gets everybody on the same page, level sets everybody and says, here, here you go. This is what uh, you know, is is going to happen here. If you were to click on that graphic, you know, it gives you even more detail about what the tasks are. Um, you know, in the in the pre activities phase, we're we're looking at uh, sort of task one dot one pre project planning and coordination. If you click on you know this graphic, it actually gives you a lot more detail about that uh, about what that actually means. And then, um, you know, below that graphic, I think is is a really great uh, way to organize things is it has tools right at the top. It says, here you go. Here's tools, templates, everything that we found that we know other people use that's going to be useful to you in your effort to go through this, this uh, process. You know, here's all the tools up top. Um, and then right below that, best practices, lesson learned. Uh, and and so you have kind of the, the most pertinent information right here. Um, you have sort of the, the process, the tools, and here's the best practices and lessons learned. And I think this, um, in a lot of ways, is just a really simple way to look at sort of these um, these processes that might be, you know, industry standard in a lot of ways, but maybe not codified, right? So, like, think about think about from like a UX perspective or human factors research. You know, you you have sort of this discovery phase, uh, the the um, data gathering phase, uh, design phase, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of analysis phase, and then an iteration phase, and then development phase, right? And think about that, right? And then what if we had a tool for us, right? Well, in in development, you have might have a bunch of development tools at top, and here's some best practices about how to integrate for developers with human factors practitioners or UX people, right? Like it, it, it would be a good thing for them to click on. I'm in the development phase. I'm going to click on this and here's the tools that I could use and here's how I interact with these people. Um, and so I think, you know, that whole process could be lifted from this tool that we're talking about here, the construction safety and planning phases. Um, and, yeah. and really brought to other domains. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think you you could. I mean, the what is really neat is, like I say, is, is where it pulls together um, all the different bits that you'd want to use. However, I would also suggest that they do need to get a, um, a UX designer or UI designer on board because this is just this is just almost so good that it kind of gets let down um, right at the last moment. So you mentioned that if you click on the click on the diagram, it brings you a whole wealth of information. And so what it does, um, just to try and paint the picture, you've got the nice pretty diagram, which does label things out nicely. It's got nice little diagrams and the right sort of shape boxes to pick. It. You click on the diagram, then it just brings you up a massive web box and just loads and loads of text, which my, I mean, I'm a graphical person, my eyes then just lays over. Um, for, for some really simple changes uh, today, to make this really good, I would have each one of them as a as its own unit. As I click on... Yeah. Each box, then you pip, pip, pop up another little diagram, or you know maybe just a sing a, a small bit of almost like a tooltip type affair to make that work. Um, it's a, it's it's a lot of it's like these tools that seems quite typical. It's it's a really good idea. It's really really neat and kind of just just when it could be great. 
So it sort of falls over that. So a bit of advice, and you know, a free usability review right there um, for for the um, uh, for the project. They they if they did that, I think they would they would go from from great to really great. Um, but it's cool though. I like I like to say they we could use it in in order to do. I mean, we do the human factors integration processes. Um, that can be quite a complex yeah. thing with different tools to be doing different things. It's a it's the top of my head because it's something I'm doing a lot of at the moment. And having an approach like this could make everybody's life just that little bit easier. Um, yeah, I, I worked with folks that worked on like an HSI tool a long time ago that was kind of similar to this. Um, and you know, I, I think the the main takeaway here that I'm I'm getting from this is this is going to be awesome for this domain. But really, like, let's open this thing up and apply it to other domains because the more we have these collaborative efforts ab around sort of making sure that that domain knowledge is captured, transferred, and easily accessible for others um, within the domain, then it's going to, you know, pay dividends down the road, right? You, you no longer have to pick and search, uh, go and find and search for all these different aspects they're just kind of right there which is the beauty of the tool and yes there's you know some some things that could be updated and you know this is a v1 I, you know yeah. but but yeah you're right i mean i think there's there's a lot of um there's a lot of great resources here and i just think of how powerful this could be in in other types of communities right well is it worth us doing you know we've started to do the breakdown bit if we took this as sort of that generic form of this idea of having um, the, um, the the process processes um, put online or and, you know, available in this way. If we break that down through our um, human factors views, then we can actually try and pick out some of them bits that, that um, other people could take and put into their own platforms. Um, so I was kind of thinking like around the personnel area where, you know, what would this do for us? Um, and for me, I, I think I kind of said it in the blurb, which was, one thing, a thing that breaks down quite a lot is this bit where you, know, you might have software engineers developing to software standards, standards, others, you know, maybe doing human factors integration to our human factors integration standard, um, and other, you know, all the other disciplines. If we've got this one central resource, there can be no excuses for people not knowing the process that you're following, what you're meant to be doing, and when you're supposed to be doing it. So if you're using that same material, you should, everybody should be on the same page. And therefore, you know, it, any of them sort of blockers around miscommunication should, in theory, be be removed. Do you think that's the case? Do you think Do you think that, that's, that's a fair assumption to make? But Barry, what if it updates? What if the guidance updates? Well, yeah, that's, that's as we said earlier, that's kind of my problem with it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, look, like, <clears throat> here's the thing, is this was done as a research experiment experiment or research exercise and and created um you know with funds i'm yeah. thinking what if you took the open source approach what if you had almost a wikipedia type uh you know editors moderators admins type of thing where um you have you know influential people in that community or that uh domain that you're building the tool for moderate this thing and then you know if the guidance ever were to change like in this example the faa if they came out with new guidelines you can say hey these are current for you know and slap it on as a banner on every single page and say look like that we're still updating this this has not you know been vetted it's not been um sort of uh cleared <laughs> if you will so take everything with a grain of salt and kind of just puts you in that weird headspace as everyone's trying to figure out these new guidelines and then everyone can kind of contribute together. I think that really would get more at that collaborative effort um, as well, because then you'd have, you know, places where various different types of users might be able to come forward, right? Let's let's say the example that's a little bit more uh, familiar to home, right? Let's say you have um, UX researchers, designers, PMs, uh, and de uh, developers, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you have sort of a, a traditional software development team. Uh, and so, so like, let's, let's look at it from that perspective, right? You might have developers who come in and say, Hey, you know, I, I was talking with my, um, UX researcher about X, Y, and Z, and we had a really great breakthrough here. Um, you know, almost like a forum, but then have that, 
that thing come forward as a best practice. I don't know. There's There's got to be a way to like let different roles submit things that go into different places. I don't know. I, I think this is really cool. <laughs> I'm just i thinking about like how we can how we can make this better. Where you would, I mean, what what I would be doing with the FAA stuff, for example, or anybody who's producing um, standards, they generally do want a website that has an RSS, RSS feed. And so then I would be taking the RSS feed from here and I either having some sort of live update or right. if you've got somebody who can do the coding, um, do the comparison between the current content and the current RSS feed. And if there, if there's a change, then it's either as simple as, like say, if it's a, almost a wiki type approach, flagging it, this is now out of date and needs an update. It pushes somebody to, to do that. Um, or even just some more direct, you know, there could be some clever direct merging there going on, which works right to the point that, the the you know the authority changes the, the the structure of what they're doing or something like that but even just a simple flag to say you know there's been in you know, the latest version that we that this is codified to is this there is a new version out we need to do the update that has value because when I sort of looked at this from the system safety perspective um, yes if you do all this as we say loads the element of miscommunication but it is also because of that knowledge issue not because of that data issue it's also a single point of failure. Um, that if everybody commonly uses their own data, everybody will feel spectacularly. But as you say, if you've got um, um, so, some di so, some different eyes on this, um, if everybody's looking at the same data, more chance there's a greater chance that people spot the error. Um, so yeah, I think there's there's definitely something around that around that community aspect. Yeah, that makes the, it really safe. The big problem with the community approach is like, how do you make sure or enforce that the community is actually using it, right? Like from from our perspective, UX, human factors, there's a lot of people there. Um, and, and how do you make sure that those people are using it for, you know, the things that they're working on? Um, I don't know. Let's let's uh, let's pick a couple more like fun pieces um as it as this tool applies to the traditional human factors stuff and then maybe we'll move on for me i think the um you know we, we talked a lot about the collaborative effort uh and i i, I do want to kind of push forward on that as well right when you think about sort of the organizational social uh implications unless this is being developed in tandem or with the blessing of the guidance that is coming out, right? Like if it was being blessed by the FAA, which I think in this case it is because it's TRB, um, all government, right? And so, you know, for, for industry things, it's going to be a little bit more hard to do something uh, or, or to implement something that is, or enforce something, I should say, that is going to be a tool like this. Um, when you have sort of the government standards, when you have sort of uh, a need to follow those standards, it's going to be easier, especially if it's coming from the source itself. Um, and I think that's kind of a key note that I want to sort of bring forward is that this works in cases where it's mandated uh, and and maybe falls flat in others. Yeah, and I, I guess my sort of, I guess, final point on this would be following on from that, that um this seems to be quite good because this seems to be a fully mandated end-to-end -end process. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas one of the things that we can do quite a lot in human factors and particularly the HFI world is, is tailoring. Is tailoring a process to suit the scale and development of what it is that you're trying to do. You don't necessarily want to do full process for, for a small version of, so if you're doing like say a really small airport, you might do something probably less than what you'd want to, you know, super airport type thing. Um, when you have a process laid out from this, it, People sometimes use it too much as a crutch um, and forget that some processes are tailorable and you actually get efficiencies if you do tailor things appropriately. Um, we, we, you know, it, it's too easy to fall into must do 1.1.3 because it says 1.1.3 must be done, where sometimes you don't necessarily need to do that as long as you acknowledge that up front. So that's my sort of, a, I guess, a small note of caution is something that we do quite a lot of. Yeah. Yeah, I I mean I don't want to I don't want to stretch out this discussion too much longer. One, my throat is hurting, and two, I, we got some great questions. I want to make sure we have some time to get to. Um, but you know, I, one last note, I, Barry, our numbers tend to rise quite significantly when we talk about sexy topics or like risque topics. So I'm mm -hmm. expecting a lot of downloads for this construction safety and phasing plans episode. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be big. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you to our patrons and all of our Twitter followers this week for selecting our topic. And thank you to our friends over at the Transportation Research Board for our news story this week. If you want to follow along, we do post the links to the original articles on our weekly roundups and our blog. You can also join us on our Discord for more discussion on these stories. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back to see what's going on in the Human Factors community right after this. Human Factors Cast brings you the best in Human Factors news, interviews, conference coverage, and overall fun conversations into each and every episode we produce. But we can't do it without you. The Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running the show come from our listeners. Our patrons are our priority, and we want to ensure we're giving back to you for supporting us. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like access to our weekly Q&As with the hosts, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Minute, a Patreon-only weekly podcast where the hosts break down unique, obscure, and interesting Human Factors topics in just one minute. Patreon rewards are always evolving, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you, and remember, it depends. Yes, Patreon. We especially want to thank our uh, Human Factors, Honorary Human Factors cast staff, patron Michelle Tripp. Patrons like you keep the show running. Uh, seriously, we we use those funds to, to, to support the lab and everything like that. There is one tier that uh, we don't normally talk about, um, and that is the show sponsor. Now, we do our show sponsor through Patreon. We ha- historically haven't had one, and we have wanted to keep the show sort of sponsor free. Um, and really, it's just a it's if it makes sense, we'll do a sponsor type of thing. I do want to talk about it, though, especially this month as we're doing this whole pride campaign. This would be a great month for a sponsor to jump on um, because in this tier, we'll read sort of 150 words of their choice every week um, in place of that Patreon commercial that you just heard. So if you want to reach, you know, thousands of human factors practitioners, that's a way to do it. Um you know, the, there's also a permanent link on our website that our sponsors get. I, I say all this because if you're listening and you know of a company that might be looking for human factors uh, engineers for their company and want to reach others, uh, this might be a good thing to bring up or I don't know. It's just it does help the show. Right. We're not begging for money here. Um, in fact, you know, we're like I said, we're giving away 30 percent of our Patreon proceeds this month. To the Trevor Project. It's just a good month to do it. And it's something that we don't often talk about. Um, you know, it, it's a sponsorship is an opportunity. So if you're looking for that, that, that might be something to consider. I don't know. Barry, any words on sponsorship? How's K Sharp looking? Do you got the budget for that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go and talk to the boss. Uh, no, I mean, too, it is a, I mean, this month especially is a, we were having that the conversation in the, in the pre show about, you know, a lot of companies like us are looking at the moment to say, right, what can we do that is not just, um, you know, rinse in the pride logo? What, what can we do? Something that is actually going to make a difference is actually meaningful. And, and something like this uh, would, would make an awful lot of sense. So if you're out there thinking that this is a good idea, then you need to jump on it because if you don't, I'm going to. Oh, so. there you go. Wow. Oh, did we just get a commitment on the show? Ooh. So- you saw it to oh. Are you a challenge? <laughs> <laughs> don't don't tease me with a good time, Barry. That's... <laughs> oh man! All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and switch gears and get into this next part of the show? We like to call. Came from... It came from. That's right. It came from. This is the part of the show show where we search all over the internet to bring you topics that the community is talking about. We only pick good stuff. Always. We only pick good questions. <laughs> Anything is fair game as long as it's, uh, you know, useful to somebody. I don't know. If you find these answers useful, though, uh, give us a like or follow or whatever it is. I don't know. Whatever platform you're listening or watching on, just let us know that you like this stuff to help other people find it. The, the algorithms. Algorithms. All right. We got three tonight. Uh, this first one here is by Shan Hart on the UX Research subreddit. They say, is UX research recession proof? They go on to write, I recently transitioned into a UX research role, but if a recession hits and our team is impacted, I'll definitely be the first one on the chopping block. So I'm wondering 
how recession proof the UX field is, or by extension, human factors, right? So how is Barry, in your opinion, is the UX field or human factor field recession proof? Oh, I'd love to say yes, because everybody should be doing human factors and it should be at the core and underpinning everything what we do. But I think my fear is no. Um, I think the overall field is, so you've got some sectors that will always be there and always be needed. Things like defense, things like health, the safety critical elements, certainly from a human factors perspective, that probably won't go away. Um, But maybe some of the um, other pieces where, there's certain elements that I think that people find easy, easy to chop off programs. And unless you've got um, a true understanding of the value of, of these sort of things, then maybe maybe they get chopped. So I'd love to say yes, but my fear is depend, it, it is sector dependent. Um, I don't know. I hope it is because I, I don't want to go looking for another job anytime soon. You know, throw me at it. It depends, huh? Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it's like in some ways, yes, and and really, you kind of touched on it. That it's largely whether or not <laughs> the ROI is understood by the organization that is uh, making the cuts, right? Like, uh, I think if the value is known of UX of human factors, what it brings to the table, um, they are less likely to go, but. Uh, in in a lot of cases, I have seen UX or human factors be one of the first things to go. So, yeah, it's it. Uh, I'm going to throw the it depends as well because it it really will be kind of dependent on what the company culture is and how they value those roles. And really, I, it comes back to you too. Uh, in these roles, um, how do you communicate that ROI? How are you showing? The things that you're doing are making impactful differences, uh, and that that can be scary if you're not doing that. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other last thoughts on that one? Um, yeah, I think I guess to put, to put into a real real context, I have been in the situation where I got made redundant, um, and you know I was in a, a an HF role. They said they didn't need it anymore. It went. The next day, I got a phone call from the same company saying, oh, by the way, we just realized nobody else can do what you do. Um, can you finish all the projects you're working on? It's like, but, but, you, but that, that's just weird. So sometimes, particularly in large company, people will just, you know, it's almost impersonal. People will cut things. And But I think, you know, as I've never been out of work for the past, what, 20 years that I've been in an industry, I think I think the overall industry is probably quite, like, is, is proof but if you your dream job might not be, I think it's possibly a, a, a more f- a finessed way of putting it. Yeah. And I mean, if you ever find yourself in the situation that Barry did, I mean, you, you consider yourself lucky because you can come back and say, yes, I'm absolutely willing to help. My rate is now four times what you were paying me yesterday. You oh, you were listening. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, did you do that? Because... <laughs> No, I, I, I didn't quite, I didn't do, I didn't do anything on the money, but I did turn around and this was, you know, um, what, 20, 18 years ago, something like that. But anyway, I, I did turn around and say, um, I, um, I'm going to work from home. I'm going to work these days. I'm going to do these meetings. Um, ring me if you need me. I'll come in if you need to, but I'm not coming in otherwise, blah, 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 blah. Um, and yeah, they they did try and push back on that, and I was like, "Well, what are you gonna do? Fire me, or 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 what? You you kind of already been there." Um, <laughs> so I I got an extra, I think, three months work out with them, which meant also, oh, because I also then turned around. And said, oh, by the way, and if I get job interviews or anything like that, I'm going to do them. Um, so it does sort sort of put you in a position of power for them. Last the, yeah. that last yeah. it was a yeah. That's nice. Yeah, it is nice. Uh, Call me Freckles in in the comments here is doing that with their uh, former employer or potentially future employer as well. So uh, thank you for that comment. Uh, Let's go into this next one here. This one is by uh, JWWWCC on the user experience subreddit. How much would an internship add to my value in qualifying for full-time roles? And how many should I do before applying? Uh, they go on to write, I am currently interning as a UX designer in a multinational firm, but I'm scared of the future with all these boot camps and obnoxious YouTubers and TikToker. Oh, sh- that's us. Uh, glam- <laughs> oh, no, we don't glamorize boot camps. Uh, it, <laughs> it, would be, <laughs> it would be an even more saturated field. I genuinely love what I'm doing, but finding a full time job is becoming a worry for me since I graduated from university. 
Frank, uh, Barry, what do you look for in candidates? And really, how many internships do they typically have under their belt? What's important? So I'm not. I'm going to try not steal your answer in the fact that I look for good, I look for people. I look I look for good attitude. Um, and it's it's about so for me the as an employee the value of the of the internship is not kind is is not the fact that you've done them um as such it's about you've you've had an opportunity to learn how business runs and the difference between business and being in you know being in education is could be a massive culture shock to some people and just knowing the fact that you know sometimes you you it's not like having an assignment to hand in, you know, you're, you're, there is an expectation of self-motivation. There's an, an expectation of wanting to do stuff to a high quality, not to get a good grade, but just to get it out the door um, about being able to be that self-motivated person that sorts stuff out for yourself. And, you know, just them and knowing that if you're going to go on a coffee break, then, you know, that, that's absolutely fine. That that's all good, but you are expected to sit back down at the desk as well. Um, you know, timekeeping, uh, you know, even if you're flexible working, you're still expected to be contactable. You know, all that sort of, the, the stuff that once you've been in this industry for a bit, you sort of take for granted. That's what the value for me of, about the internship is you get to learn that sort of stuff whilst you're going through um, either your education piece or post-education, whatever. Um, and then it's the, it's the value of what you've got out of that. So have you learned to be a good communicator, to be a good um a good worker, a good, good team worker um, for the good of the project, not just for the good of your own um, grades, as it were. Um, but fundamentally, it's about having that, the ability to show off that good, um, that good attitude. What, about you, Nick? what do you think? Yeah, no, I think all that is spot on. Um, you know, I think really when you're looking at, the, you know, the business um, experience is great. Not all internships have that. Sometimes you're working kind of in a sub- sect of a company it's sometimes it's weird and so the things that i am looking at here is not necessarily number um when i'm looking at candidates i'm not looking at the number of internships that you've had um and uh it, it really i'm i'm not even looking at whether or not you've had an internship i'm looking at your experience and and the quality of individual experience. I'm just going to leave it at experience, right? I initially in my notes here had internships, but this goes just for experience as well. So like if you work in a lab or if you work in uh, academia or anything like that, the, the value of, or I guess the, um, the quality of, of what you learned there and are taking forward with you is what I'm looking at. Uh, and I think Barry, you hit the nail on the head. The business experience is a big part of that. Um, how well are you going to integrate with a team that's already established? Uh, but ultimately, you know, you could have, you know, we talk about innovation all the time on the show and how it's just applying something, you know, from one domain to another. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, if you can show me that you have like some really cool ideas coming out of this, uh, internship or, um, experience that you have. Right. Then I think that's that's where I'm at. It's like bring that to the table because that's what I'm interested. In. I don't care about the number. Um, I, I care about the, uh, the the quality. So I don't know if you're if you're between a couple different options of internships. This might be another question that you ask um, if you're fortunate enough to get, you know, uh, several different offers. It's like which one of the ones are that you think are going to be the most fruitful in terms of. I would almost say breadth of experience at that point, not necessarily depth because you get the depth later um, and and the breadth will really come in handy for uh, being able to one, identify what you want to do and two, um, being able to communicate a, a wider variety of things to prospective employers. I don't know. That's my two cents. Any other closing thoughts on that one? Um, I guess there's just one thing that with what you said, it, there's a, I have a current irritation at the moment that um, um, the, a lot of employers are out there asking for graduates to, you know, re recent leavers from from um, academia to come and join companies, but also to have a breadth of experience. And I think it's it's incumbent on us as employers to recognise that um, when you're doing your your learning piece, you're doing your learning piece. You you don't come out with, you know, fully polished experience. And the and the ones that do, um, generally, you know. You, 
are they, are they come what have they given up in order to do all of that to come come to you with um i do as like i say it's a bit of a no, uh, slight annoyance at the moment i think we expect too much out of from an experience perspective um for out, out of um, recent recent academia leavers um, yeah I, I i will second that I don't yeah. <laughs> that's that's a whole separate uh, rabbit hole slash question we can get into um, all right, let's get into this last one here. What uh, questions to ask PMs before starting research project? This is by uh, Klutzy Platypus forty two oh eight on the user experience subreddit, uh, UX research subreddit. Sorry, uh, hey guys, I received my first ever project in uh, UX research. I'm really excited and want to do well. My first task would be to understand the project requirements and then interact with the stakeholders and PM to learn about the business goals, target users, etc. I'd like to know what kind of questions I need to ask the PMs. Uh, of course, there's some things that I know, but uh, what, what are the right, how do I frame the right questions to understand how I move forward? Barry, what type of questions do you typically ask the PMs on your projects? Stupid questions. Yes. Lots and lots and lots and lots of stupid questions. And th there's two reasons be behind that. One is, uh, particularly if I'm working in a team, um, and I'm leading the team especially, I've got, um, I want to show to other people that I've got no problem with, with asking stupid questions. Because the only stupid, and it's a cliche, but the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. Um, we generally go into projects not not knowing anything or anywhere near as much depth as the stakeholders you're working with, the users you're working with. So just get the, I, I like to um, work out who my stakeholders are. What Really, what's the point of the project? What is it you're trying to get to? But not the point that they think it is, but actually, what is it you're really trying to achieve? Almost get into the, um, that one step beyond um, what are you trying to achieve as, as opposed to what it is you're trying to do? Um, who's it for? You know, it, what, sometimes you can be doing, I, I got into a, a fairly interesting situation, you know, within the past 12 months where I was designing um, or uh, helping manage a, a design that I thought was going to be for, for clients and customers. And it wasn't until towards the end that we realized, actually, it's not. It's for to give a potential, a potential future funder confidence that, that this app could do do great things. Well, that changed the entire perspective of what we were doing. And it's because we didn't really truly understand who was the product for and then and, the, and why you're doing it. Um, and again, it sounds like quite simple because somebody will come in and say, we've got requirements, we've got pages of requirements, we've got books of requirements um, or not, depending on what you're doing. But actually then get, get, into, um, get somebody to put it into a simple phrase or a simple sentence, a simple paragraph. What is it you're trying to do? Um, and then he, he asks stupid questions, just get people to clarify. I mean, the, doing the who, the whole who, what, why, when, where um, approach. Again, it, it's a simple framework, but actually it can be quite powerful if you if you use it consistently. Um, but yeah, do, just just ask questions, um, dig into it. Um, I get it's not really that helpful to to, to the way that the way that they've asked it, but you you know because I don't think there is a true framework out there. There's, there's no be all and end all. It, it's about how you interact with the stakeholders, with the project manager, um, because some stuff they'll give over willingly and then you dissect some of that stuff. Or they might just turn around and say, well, you just get on with it. Um, and then yeah. you, you almost have to start from scratch and, and it's like uh, digging uh, through granite. Um, what about you, Nick? How, how do you do it from, um, from the beginning? Same. All right, we're getting to the next part of the show. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so... <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Ask those stupid questions. I, I think I want to spend a little bit more time on the types of stupid questions that I ask. The who, what, when, where, why is really important. And I think the first thing that I like to start with is the context. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing the thing that we're doing? The why? Um, and then I kind of go into the what. What are the business goals? Why are Why are we doing this to fulfill what business goals? Uh, and then really from there, it's like once I sort of understand um, you know, the context behind something, the business goals as to why we're doing that thing. Then I get into sort of what is our objective? What do you as a PM want out of this research? Because that is really critically important. Um, if the PM doesn't get something that they don't, that they need, then you're not going to have a successful research project. You're, you're, you're largely going to give them something that is unusable to them. And so having a conversation with them about what is the final product that they need. Do they need a spreadsheet of something? Do they need a PowerPoint presentation detailing use cases of something? Do they need, um, you know, a detailed competitive analysis of something, right? Be very clear what they need at the end of all this 
so that way they can move on, right? Or, or update requirements or anything like that. Do they need updated designs? That in a lot of cases is true. They do. Um, and, and that is, you know, your responsibility to work with design and, and do all that. But so really understanding the context of everything. And then, um, you know, the, the other types of questions that I like to ask is, okay, wh what exists out there today um, that, that you can send my way? This could be like Jira tickets. This could be like community questions from existing users that they have on, you know, in a backlog somewhere and asking all these questions and putting it all on the table and saying, okay, here's everything that we have. Well, one, that generates leads for users. If you say, you know, hey, has anyone mentioned this to you? Yeah, well, I had a guy from this company. Oh, well, why don't we reach out to him for comment? Um, that's like an immediate in. And so starting to get everything in one place and consolidate everything that you know about a project is going to really go a long way, especially when you consider um, sort of how to approach a research project that will change over time. Um, you know, other questions, what users are this for? Uh, or who, who is this for? Who do we want to talk to? Because there's sometimes things that you're developing for somebody that might actually you want to include talking to somebody else in there, right? Do you include a decision maker when it's actually um, somebody who's using the product? Well, the decision maker is going to decide whether or not that gets enabled. So yeah, let's talk to them. Um, so, so these are the types of questions. Uh, and there's a lot of them. Um, I would highly recommend that you sort of come up with some sort of framework for asking all these questions in a in a consistent way and documenting the answers um, so that way you know where to find those answers as you go through and develop your research. That's a lot to say, Barry, I ask the same types of questions. Um, but yeah, there's there's a million ways to do it. Just do it what, what's right for you, but ask everything, everything. Get as much detail as you can, everything in the kitchen sink, even if you don't think it's uh, necessary because it probably is. All right. Now let's get to the part of the show where we say one more thing. Barry, what is your one more thing this week? So this week I've picked up a new hobby. Wow. Yeah. And it's roasting my own coffee. Wow. I know. I had no idea really that you could e do it so easily from home. Cause obviously I'm quite a fan of, um, uh, filter coffee and well, you know, um, almost any, any type of coffee really bring, bring on the caffeine. Oh, with um, these but Thursday I, nights, of course. Well, yeah. Um, so I sort of got into into looking and said, "Well, how hard could this be?" Because obviously, we, you know, getting hold of um, the 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 actual coffee beans themselves is kind of difficult in the UK because we don't have the uh, the climate to make it work. But if you could get hold of them, is roasting your own coffee a thing? Could that that work? And I've learned all sorts of YouTube is so much my friend at the moment. Um, so I'm learning all about um, roasting coffee. So I've I've now roasted my own coffee at home. Um, so I've had my beans and I've, I've, I've ground it and everything. And I had a friend around for coffee this afternoon with my, my own roasted coffee. And, and he said, very complimentary. That's not bad. That's so not bad. I, I, thought, I was like, well, it was a weird one when I sort of picked out my first, I had my first cup of coffee with it and I don't know what I expected, but I was like, this tastes like coffee. And I think oh. that was just. That was just a bonus. You know, I, I didn't know whether I expected it to take. Because, you know, when, like, maybe you cook, you bake a cake or something, and it's not quite the same as somebody who can do it really well. Um, mm -hmm. like this, but I had this cup of coffee, and it tasted like a good cup of coffee. I was like, that, I, I've done that. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of myself at the moment. We we need to make Barry the Barista merch. Can, uh, can we yeah. make Barry the Barista merch? We should well, get somebody in our lab on it. Anyway, <laughs> that, 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 that sounds like that sounds that sounds a good idea. <laughs> I'm very much toying with the idea of the. Do I want to? So is this just something that I do at home, or does it become a side hustle, where I now I start develop, developing my own brand and start selling um, coffee to the local area? Um, I, I could because it requires no, you know, it's so different from the day job that it's actually quite good fun to do. And actually, I was surprised it doesn't actually take very long to roast a batch of coffee. It's about 15, 20 minutes. Huh. Um, I don't know why I expected a lot more. Um, and it was it's just quite therapeutic. So I I, I don't know. I, this this might end up to be an entirely new enterprise. I might give up human factors forever and and just become a coffee roaster. We, we yeah we we need to get some Barry the barista merch. <laughs> yeah. It's yes. gotta happen. I, I need an apron, a brown apron. <laughs> yeah. We can, can put it on an apron. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, that's about me. Nick, what about you? What's your one more thing? Oh, in traditional Barry fashion, I'm going to do three more things today. <laughs> I know you do two. I, don't I know, but you didn't do two today, so I'm going to take one of yours. <laughs> okay, fair. <laughs> and I only, I always do one. So here's here's the thing. So uh, there was a lot going on before I had to leave uh, for mm-hmm. vacation and uh, there was a lot going on um and that was a lot i just want to say it probably seemed seamless to you listening or watching uh but that was a lot of work and just thank you for sticking with us in our like one week of technical absence but really it was like a three-week vacation for us back here behind the scenes actually not really it was like, <laughs> it's like maybe a week <laughs> vacation for me because i was still doing stuff um but that leads me to my second point here. Star Wars Celebration is where I went. It was great. Um, I got to see the first two episodes of Obi-Wan with Hayden Christensen and Ewan McGregor in the same room. Uh, it was it was pretty sweet on the big screen, you know? Um, and uh, I was posting all about it in the Discord. You can go and see, like, my... in. Uh, I think it was in the random channel. You can go and see kind of my experiences as they were happening. I was like, Oh, I was, you know, a hundred feet away from some cool people. Um, and you know, I think the, the most, or, or I guess the, the biggest thing that I think that whole experience for me this time around last time, it was just, it, it, I, I say it jokingly, not jokingly. Uh, it was, it was a spiritual experience last time because it was the chewy we're home trailer. And, you know, I was there with all the big stars on the stage and um, it was just to, to be around that fandom in a loving, caring environment. Like there was there's it, fandom can be incredibly toxic in a lot of cases. And it just wasn't in this place. Um, and it just it's so comforting to have that uh, in, in one place, it's just despite, you know, all the germs floating around. But um, I think the, the biggest thing for me is that we added a new fan to that mix when we went. My, my wife and I have been really careful with how we've introduced Star Wars to my son's life. Um, we never wanted it to, to be too forced. You know, he knows what a lightsaber is. He looks over my shoulder and sees these. He knows what those are. Um, but when we went, you know, he was saying hi to R2-D2. He was saying hi to BB-8, all the droids. He's a droid fan. He loves droids. Um, and just the fact that we made a Star Wars fan out of that little kid uh is is like that that warms my heart um and and that leads me to my third point of the one more thing it's all connected is uh his costume his costume uh i've been talking about it for weeks my wife and i spent so much time on this thing we never got him into the full costume and that's okay we got him into almost everything sans the mask which is sitting right here above my right shoulder um we didn't forget it like Barry did his audio equipment for EHF, but we brought it. He just didn't want to wear it because it. I'm sure it feels claustrophobic, low field of vision, you know, all that stuff. So we got a pretty good picture of him. Again, it'll be in the Discord. You can go see it there. Um, and and the character that it's supposed to be, Darth Revan, uh, which is also his name, um, Revan. We name him Darth. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> it was just overall a really positive experience. And, uh, you know adjusting to being back is um <laughs> it's a lot it's a lot man there's it's, uh, and being sick like i was fine until friday after the lab meeting i'm raising my voice but i was fine until friday after the lab meeting and then something just hit me and like just over the weekend out and then monday tuesday out like it's just bad okay that's my one more thing and i think that's the show uh so thank you everyone for joining us uh this week if uh if you like what uh we talked about today especially around the topic of airports i don't know uh i'll encourage you all to go listen to what happens when uh we have flying cars and what that means for the future of transportation episode 213 and these airports might even become obsolete we never know uh comment wherever you're listening with what you think of the story this week i don't know it's a little non-traditional for us but let us know for more in-depth discussion you can always join us on our community discord uh, visit our official website, sign up for our newsletter, stay up to date with all the latest human factors news and keep up with our pride campaign too. We have new stuff dropping all month long uh, to celebrate pride. If you like what you hear, you want to support the show. There's a couple things you can do. One, leave us a five-star review wherever you're listening, watching, viewing, whatever. 
that really helps other people find the show says it, it's good or whatever, or leave us a bad review. I don't know. Don't do that. That's mean. Um, <laughs> tell, tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is how we grow. Seriously. If somebody says, Hey, I listened to this really great podcast and these guys, uh, this, this one guy was sick the whole time. And the other guy talked about tools and, uh, and coffee. It was, it was great. Uh, that'll really help us grow. And three, if you can, Support us on Patreon. That's 30% of our proceeds this month going to the Trevor Project. Um, and especially if you want to become a show sponsor, you know, Barry said he'd jump on it if uh, no one else did. So either way, I got a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just kidding. But do do check out the Patreon. We, we do always kick back a lot of stuff for our patrons. Uh, and this month, especially, you'd be doing uh, a lot of youth uh, a, a good favor. Uh, I want to thank... Um, Links to all, all of our socials and our website in the description of this episode, as always. I want to thank Mr. Barry Kirby for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about you about the exciting world of construction safety? Exciting world. Interesting <laughs> words. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Buzz underscore K and other socials at Mr. BP Kirby. Um, but if you want to hear some Human Factors interviews, come and find me on 1202 the Human Factors podcast at 1202podcast.com. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on our Discord server when I'm not sick and across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it depends. depends.